Welcome to Video Lecture M2. This is on linear transformations. I'm your sage on the stage, Tom Roby. So the main objective of this video lecture is to analyze multipli matrix multiplication as actually representing a kind of transformation, a function, from R to the N to R to the M. So I've got this backwards. It always goes from R to the N to R to the M, not the other way around. And I'll fix it on the handouts, but it's important to get straight. And it's just the, the conventions that we always use in this class and in most texts on linear algebra. So what I want to do is translate natural questions about a matrix transformation into the standard thing that we always do, which is trying to solve systems of linear equations. Eventually in this course, we'll get away from everything we want to do involves solving systems of linear equations. But they, they do come up a lot. So here's the key idea, which is that we want to think about our function, we want to think about our matrix A as really being something that eats a vector x and spits out a vector y. Now it just operates by matrix multiplication, which is fair enough. So my, here I've got it right. T is going to go from R to the N to R to the M, and it's going to go via just T of x is take that vector x and left multiply by A. Right? So the picture that I have in my head, it's kind of a blob. But it's OK. If you want to make it less blob-like, you could think of it as more rectangular blob because we're talking about linear spaces. But so I've got one blob that represents what I'm going to call the domain of the function. And I've got one which is I'm going to call the codomain. The problem is you'd like to call it domain and range, but range usually means just the things they get mapped to. And in general, our codomains will be bigger than our ranges. So this is going to be r to the n, and this is going to be r to the m. And I'm going to think about this as being a transformation t. And t is given, as we said, by t of x equals a times x. So what, that, what does that mean? That means that, well, so I've got, I'm in r to the n somewhere. And so I've got, let me, let me map, put 0 somewhere. So, so 0 is going to sit here right in the middle. There's a 0 vector over here. There's a zero vector here. This one has n components. This one has m components. And then there are other vectors floating around. So how does this all work? So for example, there might be some vector x over here. And this vector x this maps over here to some other vector, which I'll call t of x. And now there are lots of questions that we ask all over mathematics, because they're important questions, like, you know, is there I know because this is a function that x has to have a well-defined place to go, right? But it's perfectly plausible that there could be some other, other thing here, maybe some vector z, and z could end up going to the same place. In other words, it could be possible that t of x and t of z are equal, right? We don't know, and sometimes this will happen and sometimes it won't. When, it, when this never happens, we say that the function transformation is one-to-one. -one. Um, so some more terminology here. So this thing that's called t of x, so t of x will be called the image of x. Okay, that's fair enough, right? You've got something and then you do the transformation and you get something else that's not exactly it, but it's its image, right? It's image under the thing, under the transformation. And so now we've got the domain, we've got the codomain, and so then the range, so this is the other thing I need to, to define, the range of t is going to be equal to the set of all things that you can get, the set of all t of x, where x is an element of r to the n, which is the domain. So I look at where everything possible goes here, right? And so what's that range going to be? Well, I don't know exactly, but let's, let's draw a picture. So I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about everything that I've got here, and well, maybe it doesn't Maybe when I look over here, it only gets me part of it. So maybe these, this is the range, right? Maybe some, some piece of r to the m gets missed out when I map. Sometimes it'll happen, sometimes it won't. And analyzing what happens in different examples is just part of the fun of linear algebra. But we know that everything in r to the n has to be mapped somewhere, right? That's just the definition of a function. Okay. So those are the basics. Domain over here, codomain over here, 
The range is a subset of the codomain. An image is an image of a specific point. Um, and two different points could possibly have the same image depending on what your transformation is. All right, so let's take a quick example. Suppose that A is 320112, so this is a 3 by 2 matrix. So what is it going to eat? It's going to eat vectors in R to the 2, right, R squared, because I have to take linear combinations of two columns, right? So I could ask, what is T of 1, 2, where really when I say T of 1, 2, I think of 1, 2 as being the same thing as that vector 1, 2. It's just sometimes it's easier to write it linearly, and it also looks a little bit more function-like. Okay? Well, so this is just a computation, right? All I have to do is say, well, T of 1, 2 is, so I have to take 3, 2, 0, 1, 1, 2. I multiply it times 1, 2. And I'm going to get a 3 vector, which is the linear combination that I get by adding one of these and two of these. So I'll get 3 plus 2 times 2 is 3 plus 4 is 7. I'll get 0 plus 2 is 2. And I'll get 1 plus 2 is 5. So if I did this right, then I got 7, 2, 5 as the, um, the image of 1, 2. Okay, so this is the... image of 1, 2. All right, that's this vector here. Okay, so now what? What else am I going to do? So that's just an evaluation. I could ask, is 1, 2, 3 in the range of t? So that's saying, okay, I'm over here. I'm looking in some of my vectors. So here are my vectors going from R2 to R3. So I'm going from a smaller space to a bigger space. Is 1, 1, 2, 3 is somewhere over here. Is it in the range of t? Right? So what is that saying? Well, that's asking the following question, right? It's asking, take a different color here. It's asking the question, can I solve 3, 0, 1, 2, 1, 2, augmented matrix 1, 2, 3? Does that have a solution, right? Because then I would be able to find the solution would be exactly the vector that I multiply this matrix by to give me 1, 2, 3, right? It's just solving the vector equation, ax equals b. All right, well, so we know how to do that, right? So we just have to do a little bit of row reduction, and I will do that on the spot here for you. So let's see, it's probably going to be easiest if I move the 1, 2, 3 up to the top. So I've got 1, 2, 3. And I'll move the, I guess I can leave 0, 1, 2 here. And now I'll have 3, 2, 1. And now what's going to happen next? Well, I guess I'll uh, move down here. So if I multiply by negative 3 and add, then I'll 0 this out. Um, multiply by negative 3 and add. And I'll have negative 6 plus 2, that'll be negative 4. Okay, so what do I have? I still have 1, 2, 3. I still have 0, 1, 2. But now I'm going to have, um, multiply by negative 3 and add negative, so 0, negative 4. Multiply by negative 3 and add, so I have negative 9, so then this is going to be negative 8. Okay, and now I notice that I can factor, I can rescale the bottom row, and I end up with, 1, 2, 3, 0, 1, 2. Well, it's just going to be 0, 1, 2, right? And so now I've got the same row twice. And so um, in row reduced echelon form, this becomes 1, 2, 3, 0, 1, 2, 0, 0, 0. Okay, so I end up with 0 equals 0. And I've got two columns, so what do I get? So this means that x1 equals 3 minus 2x2, 
x2 is equal to Ah, I didn't finish doing the row reduction. Right, so then instead of stopping here, so this is an instructive mistake here, right? Because you can see that what I should have done is I should keep going one more step. And so when I use this to get rid of this, I'll end up with, so zero out this two with this one, I'll end up with one, but now I'll have a zero here. And now I had multiplied by negative 2 and added, which means I have a minus 1 here. Good. And now I have 0, 1, 2 and 0, 0, 0, which is irrelevant. So what have I got? This implies that x1 is negative 1 and x2 is 2. Okay. So therefore, x1 equals negative 1, x2 equals 2. And so what I'm claiming now is that that is the vector over here. Right, so over here somewhere I've got negative 1, 2, and according to this transformation, that's what goes, oh, it has to go someplace in here, that's what goes to 1, 2, 3. Okay, so that's, and you can check, right, that if you take negative 1, 2 times this, what do you get? So negative 1, 2 would give us, um, minus 3 plus 4 is 1, and then 2, and then negative 1 plus 4 is 3. So yeah, if we put a negative sign here, then indeed we get 1, 2, 3. Okay, good. So it all worked. And the last question I'd like to ask is, is there more than one x that maps to 1, 2, 3? Remember this question of whether x and z both go to the same thing. Okay, and so the answer to that is, well, when we computed it, we computed that there was a unique solution. So we know that it's unique, and so there isn't more than one thing. Okay? So now, what you may want to do is do the same question for this one. And I think I'm not going to do it all out for you, but I'll just let you, I'll tell you what the answers are so that you can double check at home. So if you compute, so it's easy to compute that when you take B, so I'll write right over here so I'm not inter interrupting with other things. If you take b and you multiply it times um, 2, 1, 3. See, so now this is a 2 by 3 matrix, so it eats vectors of size 3. So you multiply by 2, 1, 3, um, you'll see that you get 2, 5. And if you go the other way, let's see. So, so now what we're trying to do is ask, can we solve 2, 1, 1, 3, negative 1, 0 is equal to 2, 4. And I claim you don't have to go very far to see that you can do this because um, this will be solvable for every B because if you row reduce this matrix, you'll see that you have a pivot in each row. And so that means that um, you don't have any rows of zeros that could be equal to a constant and you'll have at least one free variable so that means it always has a solution. So in fact, in this situation, there'll always be multiple solutions, right? So this has multiple solutions, which we can see just from doing it. I mean, if you really want to, I mean, I guess the, to convince you of that, the one thing I should do is maybe say this is row equivalent to, okay, 1, 3, 0, 4, and now if I multiply by negative 2 and add, then I'll get 0, multiply by negative 2 and add, I'll get um, negative 5, multiply by negative 2 and add, this is still minus 1, multiply by negative 2 and add, then I get negative 5, right? But so now it's clear that there's a pivot in every row. Okay, and I don't even need to divide through by this to put it in row reduce echelon form or something. It's just clear that there will be infinitely many solutions no matter what right-hand side I put here. Okay, so for this matrix, everything is in the range. Because no matter what B, a vector of length 2 you give me here, I'll always be able to find the vector of length 3 over here. 
So because this matrix was going from R3 to R2. Okay, so I hope that was at least sort of clear, and we'll see lots more examples um, soon in case it wasn't. So one good, you should always look at uh, simple examples when you're first trying to learn something, and that'll give you some fodder so that you can understand the theory and understand more complicated examples. One thing I highly recommend is there's an applet by uh, a professor named Lauren Williams at um, Mary Her Mercy Hurst University, and so that's uh, the URL that has it. It should also be linked. We'll, we'll post it somewhere on the LMS, or it's on my um, linear algebra homepages. So, but and so that's a really good thing to play play with different kinds of standard linear linear transformations from R two to R two. So for each of these linear transformations, I want to just consider some very simple matrices. And so in each of these situations, it's easy to draw what's going on because you know, we can think about, I probably should have put pauses in between these, but we'll, we'll just do them one at a time. All right? So here's, I mean, really R2 goes in both directions, so I should draw more of it. But, um, you know, let's think about what would happen if I just took the standard basis vector and thought about that as like the unit square. So here's a unit square that's based at 0, 0 and goes out to 1, 1. And I want to know where that goes under this linear transformation. And so, well, it's not hard to see that under this linear transformation, Right? And you can try it by plugging in what it does to 1, 0, and 0, 1. I'll give you a hint. What it does to 1, 0 is it just sends it to 3, 0. And what it does to 0, 1 is it just sends it to 0, 1, half. In fact, that's always true that the, the standard basis vectors always go to the columns of the matrix. And so that'll be very useful for us later on. But in particular here, what this is saying is that I take this unit square and I stretch it by a factor of 1, 2, 3 horizontally and I scale it by a factor of 1 half. So here's 1 half, here's 1. So the image of that under this transformation is the following rectangle. So every point in here goes to a point in here. And in fact, 0, 0 goes to here, and 1, 1 goes to there, and everything else goes the way you think it should. Okay? So this is a very simple rescaling thing. And one particular example, of, I mean, there's nothing special about these numbers 3 and a half. If these numbers are A and B, then you're scaling horizontally by A, and you're scaling vertically by B. In particular, if I had A and B both be equal to 1, then I would just have the identity matrix, which sends, this, sends everything back to where it started. So in particular, this pink unit square would end up back where it started. Okay. All right, so let's take a look now at 2. We've got a little bit of room. Let me uh, split it up here and look at 2. Okay, so now B is, in this case, the vector. Um, so where does it send things? It sends this unit vector gets sent to negative 1, 0. So it gets sent to its opposite. I guess I should make clear that this is the transformation that's given by A. So now I'll have the transformation that's given by B. And so what does it do to this unit vector? Sometimes we call this E1. Well, it actually sends it to its negative. Okay? And what does it do to E2? It leaves it alone. So here's E2. That's the same. So it just it doesn't change it at all. And okay, well, so what that means then is that it's taking this unit square, and it's sending it to this unit square. And how is it doing it? Well, it's actually doing it in such a way that, for example, if I put the letter, you know, B over here, when I looked at its image, it would be the backwards B over there. Okay? So this second linear transformation is reflection about the y-axis. 
Okay, if you think this is the x-axis, this is the y-axis, this is reflection about the y-axis. So far so good? All right, so now let's do another example. Let's look at C. So in C we've got All right, so what happens? We've got E1 here. We've got E2 here. So here's our unit square. And now what's going to happen under this? Well, E1 goes to 1, 0. So E1 doesn't change, right? E1 just sits here. But E2, maybe I should have made this a different color, E2 goes to 1, 1, which is this vector. Okay? And so, really by the parallelogram law, what that means then is that this unit square is going to end up going to this parallelogram. And so this kind of a transformation is actually called a shear transformation. This is called, these, this, these are scaling matrix matrices, and this one is called uh, reflection. And so these are all things that happen in all dimensions, but they're easiest to understand in two dimensions. Right? So notice that I can't write the domain down below and the range up here. That'll work if you've got a function of two variables where the output is just a single constant, right? Because then you've got a function from R2 to R3. You can see the domain and the range all in one picture. That's what we did in multivariable calculus. But in linear algebra, it's really hopeless because even the, the smallest interesting examples really are these examples from R2 to R2. And so you need four dimensions. You need two dimensions of domain and two dimensions of range. So that's why we write the domain and the codomain separately, right? So in each of these pictures, um, this is the domain. And this is the codomain. Right, and that's true for each of these, these pictures. So the shears are, are kind of interesting maps. And you can also combine things, right? You can do a shear and then you can rescale, or you can rescale and then reflect. And so what this applet that I've pointed out lets you do is combine linear transformations. And it will show you what the matrix is for all of them. Or you could start with the matrix and input it and see what it does. And it shows you it has several different things that as a picture of a house, and so you can see what it does to the house as opposed to the, to the square. Okay, last one is, what does this matrix D do? Okay, so this is um, 4 now. So this was 3. So I want to know what the matrix D does, which is given by that. Okay, so let's see. So what happens? It says that 1, 0 gets sent to itself, right? So E1 still gets sent to E1, all right? But E2, E2 gets sent to 0, right? That's what that second column is. So E2 just gets sent to 0. And the effect that has is that any vertical component in a vector gets smushed, gets projected or flattened onto the x-axis. So what that means then is that you know, this thing here just ends up all living on top of that uh, the vector I wrote for E1. And in general, it'll take whatever complicated thing you want to throw its way. Hmm. Maybe I'll use this. All right, so if I have, it doesn't matter what kind of a shape I have. If I take a shape like that and I apply this map, all I'm going to do is get something flattened along how, whatever its dimension, wherever it actually has, a, has an x component. Okay? And you can obviously project not just onto this axis, but onto that axis, or even onto diagonal lines. And so all of those things are available through this applet. Um, and of course, things get more complicated in higher dimensions, and we'll try to analyze that. But in particular, a dia matrix like this one that's called diagonal that's sort of our poster child for an easy to understand matrix, right? I mean, this one's also diagonal, and so there's some reflecting going on here. But basically, matrices like these, you know, they sort of 
they basically just re maybe they reflect, but basically just rescale things in one um, independently, perhaps in the two different dimensions. And that's a matrix that is much easier to understand than if we have a lot of entries in the matrix. So one, one of our later goals for this course will be to learn how to diagonalize matrices whenever that's possible. So that's it for this video lecture. Thank you for your kind attention.